Fifth grade, hope everybody had a great Memorial Day. Uh, we're going to continue with Crash. We left off when um, Crash was getting his grandpa some uh, Christmas present and felt like he had to get him something, didn't care what it was, he just had to get him something um, or something bad was going to happen. So that is where we left off. All right. Chapter 34, January 1st. Mike came over today. The rest of the family went off to visit Uncle Herm, so we had the place to ourselves. When we weren't in the kitchen, we were in my room watching the parades and bowl games and, and tapes and checking out each other's Christmas stuff. Mike got a jet water Uzi and a Walkman, which I didn't get. He got a TV, but my old one is bigger, 21 inches, to his 18 inch for him. Plus, he doesn't have the auto sleep off or wake up on his remote like I do. He got three tapes to my two, but my two cost more than his three. <clears throat> I whipped out my Raiders jacket, checked this baby, I put it on, along with the Raiders wristband and Raider cap. He flapped his hand. Ah, that ain't nothing. That's a rag. My, cow my Dallas Cowboys jacket I got last year is still better than that thing. He was sneering, but he couldn't take his eyes off my jacket. If I wanted to, he would have traded me his Cowboys for my Raiders and given me free use of the Uzi for a week besides. But then his sneer turned to a smirk, an evil grin, and I knew what was coming. He hadn't said anything about his sneakers the whole time and neither did I. I pretended I didn't notice them, but he had been wanting say he had been waiting, saving them for me. He was sitting on my bed my desk chair. He put both feet up on the desk. Okay, he said, grinning, check these. They were the most beautiful sneakers I had ever seen. Every time I went to the mall lately, I would stop at Foot Locker and stare at them. I put them on my Christmas list, but my father said no way was he going to spend more on a pair of sneakers than he did on a week's worth of groceries. Besides, he said, the pair I have are perfectly good. On the, on the last night that I talked to Scooter before the morning and the cherry tree, I asked him to try to change my father's mind. He said he would try, but I guess he never got the chance. About the only thing I remember him saying was, don't worry so much about it. It's not the sneakers that count. It's the feet. I sneered at Mike. I've seen better. He grinned. He held them bottom out to me. Check the soles, baby. They were so gorgeous. I felt woozy. Three colors. I could see myself jumping over backboards, defenders, sobbing like babies, spectators gasping at moves no human had ever made before. He stuck one in the front of my face. I could smell the white skin, smooth leather. I smacked his foot away. It ain't the sneakers, I said. It's the feet. He looked at me like I was crazy. Then he laughed. He knew I didn't believe that. While we were watching one of the tapes Mike had brought over, he got hungry again and went down to the kitchen. When he came back, he had a jelly donut in one hand and a sailor hat on his head. He had the sides pulled down like a, like a white bowl. Where'd you get it? I asked. Kitchen. The hat. Oh, the room down the hall. What were you doing in there? His tongue drilled into the donut and came out with a clump of jelly. He shrugged. I don't know, looking around. Ain't that the old dude's room? Your grandfather? Take it off, I said. Scooter never wears the hat. It sits on his bedpost. He, he said me and Abby could wear it if we ever wanted to. Mike wasn't moving. I sat his tongue drilling for jelly. I jumped up and ripped the hat off his head. Hey, he squawked. What, what you doing? I thought you said he was in the hospital. He don't need it. He's old. I screamed. He's not old and charged down the hall. I folded the brim back up like it was supposed to be. I stuck it back on the bedpost. My hands were shaking. My throat felt funny. My eyes too. I went into the bathroom and shut the door and sat on the edge of the tub. The doorbell rang. I went downstairs. I could hear that in my room Mike was said switched to sports bloopers. I did what I usually do when somebody comes to the door. I peeked from the edge of the bay window. It was Webb. He kept pushing the bell button and staring at the front door like a big dope. He had a package in his hand, sort of square, wrapped in brown paper and a string. It took him forever to give up. I could see him open the storm door and stoop. When he walked away, he didn't have the package anymore. I gave him a minute or two to get down the street, then opened the door. I brought the package inside. I could see now that the paper was cut from a supermarket bag. An envelope was taped to the top. Inside was a note. The klutzy handwriting was Webb's. Dear Mr. Scooter, my parents and I are very sorry to hear about your illness. We hope you get well very soon. In order to help you, I am sending you this jar of mud from the Missouri River. 
It was given to me by my great-grandfather, Henry Wilhite Webb III, who dived to the bottom of the river to get it at 71 years old. There is a legend about Missouri River mud, where we used to live. I have told your grandson, John. I am sure he will be pleased to tell you about it. Your friend, Ken W. Webb. P.S. As you can see, the mud is dry. Just add water. Upstairs, Mike was howling at sports bloopers. I stuck the note back in... I stuck the note back in the envelope. I stood at the window looking out. I don't know how much lot later someone hit me in the back of the head. It was Mike. He had bonked me with a new football. Man, that's the funniest thing I ever saw. Can I take it home for a couple of days? Go ahead, I said. I turned back to the window. Who was at the door? Nobody. What's that? What? In your hand. Ah, oh, nothing. Well, he said, time to eat. You got any frozen pizzas? Yeah, so let's make one. Go ahead, I said. I ain't hungry. Chapter 35, January 9th. Back to school was like a little like the first day after summer vacation. Everybody's showing off their new stuff. Mike drew a crowd with his sneakers. Mike said he has a new web caper, something to do with tricking him into eating meat. I told him I wasn't interested. The second day back, I came around a corner and bumped into Forbes. I don't even know... I don't even look at her anymore, so I just kept walking. Behind me, I heard her say, Sorry to hear about your grandfather. We were allowed to see him today. He's not at the hospital anymore. He's at a rehab place. They're supposed to teach him how to walk and feed himself and get dressed and all that. He was supposed to be in room 23. My parents rushed me and Abby ahead into the room. There were two beds. Somebody was in one, of the, one by the window. The other was empty. I whispered to my mom, He's not here. Sure he is. She whispered, he's right there. She was nodding toward the man in the bed by the window. Abby was already running over, but I still couldn't believe it. That's him? She squeezed my shoulder. We went over. Abby was on the bed, jabbering away. He was propped up on the pillow. His face, everything, was different. He was bony, like he was starving. His mouth was sort of crooked, like he was smirking, only I knew he wasn't. His right arm was on his lap. I thought something was weird, and then I realized what it was, and it was his hand. It was resting palm up, the fingers half curled. It looked dead. He kept staring at Abby while, he, while she jabbered on. He didn't blink. He didn't even seem to notice the rest of us. My mother leaned down and kissed him. Hi, Daddy. His unblinking eyes rolled up to her. Your favorite grandson is here, too. She stepped aside, and he was looking at me, or he was looking at the spot where I was supposed to be. Hi, Scooter, I said. I started to shake hands, then remembered the flopped hand and pulled back. His mouth opened like he was going to talk, but all that came out was a drop of drool. My mother wiped it away. Abby started yapping again, but he kept his eyes on me. For a second, I thought he, I saw him in there, the old Scooter, trying to get out. Suddenly, Abby shut up and looked down and smiled. His good hand had clamped tight around her wrist. In the car, going home, Abby said, Will Scooter be better by February 1st? That's your birthday, said my mother. I know. Will he be better? Not all better. It takes a long time to recover from a stroke. How about baking? Will he be at least able to do that? I don't think so. I don't think he's going to be working in the kitchen for quite some time. Why? Are you afraid I'll fire Miss Linfont and start cooking myself? Mom hired Mrs. Linfont a couple days ago. She's supposed to come over one day a week and clean the house and do the wash and three days a week to cook dinner for Abby and me. So far, she made one dinner for us. It stunk. Abby groaned. I wanted him to make fish cake, catfish cakes for me to take to school on my birthday. My mother told her, we'll get you something nice from the bakery to take in. Abby whined. I don't want that. I won't. It won't be the same. I want catfish cakes. She kicked the back of the seat. I want to have a party, she was crying. He's never going to call me Swabby again. Later, I felt clammy in the house, so I took myself for a walk. It was almost dark when I got back. I still didn't feel like going in. I wandered into the backyard. As backyards go, ours is pretty big. Bigger than Uncle Herm's, or Mike's, anyway. Bigger than Webb's whole property. There's 10 or 15 trees and lots of bushes and stuff along the edges. And the doll house. I thought I saw something on the front of it. I went over. There was a cardboard sign, scotch taped to the front. It said, Mouse House. I knelt down to look inside. Furniture was in there, tiny chairs and tables and beds and kitchen stove. 
The dining room table was about two inches long and had four chairs around it with legs as skinny as toothpicks. On top of the table was the very end tip of a slice of pizza. As I got up from the mouse house, something in the bushes caught my eye. I looked closer. It was a pile of sticks about the size of a heaping plate of spaghetti. Ten feet away, you'd never see it. I walked along the line of bushes. There was another stick pile, and there, and there, all along the tree side of the yard. As I headed for the house, I saw another one under a tree, right next to the truck. I checked out the other trees. About every other one had a pile. Before going into the house, I turned to look back. Not one stick pile was visible. The ones by the tree were on the far side. You couldn't see them from the house, even in broad daylight. I don't know why, but I just stood there for a minute. The leaves were long gone from the trees. Some of the bare branches were forked and jagged. They looked like black lightning against the sky smeared with raspberry jam. This morning, when I left for school, I stopped to check Mouse House. The pizza tip was gone. The tiny table top didn't have a crumb. All right, we're going to stop right there. Have a great day. See ya.